we're, we're, we're very excited again to welcome Craig Johnson back. He's going to be talking to us about uh, robotic low anterior resection. Craig. Good morning. Uh, my name is Craig Johnson. I'm a colorectal surgeon from Oklahoma Surgical Hospital, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've been asked to talk about complicated rectal disease uh, in dealing with this with the XI. Um, appreciate you having me here today, and I hope you enjoy this virtual robotics colorectal forum. What I'd like to say is, you know, what, what are the factors of surgery in complex rectal disease? I mean, what things actually um, create this complexity? Because as we know, when we're trying to do uh, minimally invasive pelvic surgery, many times it's difficult uh, for these reasons to use straight sticks with unstable uh, camera platforms to do complex pelvic surgery. One of the things is it's a fixed place. It's, it's confined by a bony structure. And uh, high BMI just increases the difficulty significantly. Um, visualization of important structures in planes can be difficult, sometimes impossible, um, uh, specifically in open cases, uh, but as well as laparoscopic procedures. Um, the increased complexity multiplies the difficulty uh, also involvement of uh, contiguous structures like the uterus or vagina um, or vasculature like a uh, um, uh, internal iliac or external iliac vessel uh, and pelvic uh, lateral pelvic lymph nodes. Um, reoperative pelvic surgery is, can be very, very difficult as well just due to the an anatomical changes uh, in the uh, disruption of normal planes. So... How can we overcome these limitations and challenges in complex rectal disease? Uh, again, I, I'm a big believer. Uh, technology is the way to go. XI offers the technology that that I find uh, invaluable in the pelvis. Uh, it has a stable uh, platform for visualization. Um, I can have great access to vital structures and planes and be able to view these and uh, operate on them uh, with these wristed instruments that make it uh, very natural uh, for me. Um, and then using the advanced technologies um, allow me to do this surgery uh, at the console um, and not at the bedside using straight sticks. Uh, and plus with the XI, at least uh, you know, I find I can uh, have the ability to operate in all quadrants efficiently. Um, and so what uh, this talk really has uh, more to do is to, to give examples of, of how we use these, this instrumentation in, in complex cases. And so I'm going to present um, several complex uh, pelvic cases uh, that uh, show the advantage of using uh, this technology. Um, I'm going to show you a case of, uh, of a 58-year-old female. She had synchronous colon cancers. <clears throat> she had a right colon, uh, primary tumor, and a rectal cancer, as well as metastatic disease to the right lobe of the liver. Uh, we did the right, robotic right colon resection with IC, ICA uh, six months before the pelvic surgery. She uh, did have neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation. She's not a heavy lady. BMI is only 22.7, but uh, has a complex... Um, situation uh, and what we're going to end up doing here um, the primary tumor um, is in the upper to mid rectum it, and it invades you know, into the uterus in the right adnexa and so our plan is to do an in block uh, LAR TAH BSO uh, with a primary colloanal anastomosis and temporary ileostomy um, and so we begin this case uh, just with a little visualization, there's the uterus. Uh, tumor is fixed to the uterus in the right adnexa. And again, this is an edited video, so I'm not going to spend, you know, show every detail, but here's just taking the left adnexa, ovarian vein. <clears throat> uh, 
and then you saw the port placement. I, I call this a semi-transverse port placement. It, it's a little bit higher on the left, a little lower on the right. I put the 12 millimeter port where I'm going to uh, do her temporary ileostomy. Again, uh, any patient that has a mid to distal rectal cancer that uh, requires a colloidal anastomosis, I will do temporary ostomies on them. I'm going to kind of focus on the hysterectomy part here. Um, as you can see here now, we're, um, we're placing an EEA sizer in the vagina, to, and we're below the tumor and, um, and cervix. And so I'm just wanting to make sure that we're in a, a good spot here with a good margin. Uh, that's the EEA sizer. There's cervix. And so we're essentially going to come across the vagina, uh, have done completing the TAHBSO, um, and then get coming to the posterior vagina here, and there's the anterior rectum. And so we're below the primary tumor. It's still attached to the vagina. I did not separate it. I'm sorry, to the uterus. I did not separate it. Now, I'm not going to do a vaginal extraction in this case, mainly because of uh, the tumor and the size. It's just very bulky. Um, and I want to keep all the specimen together. So we're just going to complete the transvaginal... Uh, or I'm sorry, not uh, we're going to com complete the vaginal extraction or, or division and then um, and get, get this off the rectum So after we complete the vaginal um, transection, we're going to dissect in the uh, <clears throat> rectal vaginal septum. There, we, we place some moist gauze in the vagina so we don't lose uh, pneumoperitoneum. Uh, we're going to complete the distal dissection. And I'll leave the vagina open because we're going to place the anvil through the vagina to do a... a intracorporeal placement of the anvil and then once we get to far enough distal hill we'll go ahead and transect this um, and I transect it distally as well as proximally and then I remove the proximal staple line to place the uh, anvil trans or, or intracorporeally So I place the anvil through the vagina. I use the clip applier, large clip applier, to control this anvil. I like to stabilize it, and then we'll put a, a purse string suture in here. Now, here is an example of using a V-lock. I've actually gone away from using this V-lock because I, I find this really hard to uh, cinch up around the base of the uh, anvil. Uh, I pretty much have gone to using just a straight 2 proline. And then we do the anastomosis postoperatively. This is the specimen. Here you can see the uh, cervix, uterus attached to the tumor. Um, total operative time was uh, three hours. I spent um, an hour and, or two hours and 20 minutes on the console. Little blood loss. The patient only stayed two days. Her uh, milligram morphine equivalent was 10 milligrams a day. Pathology showed this to be a T4N0M0 because of the metastatic disease to the liver. Um, and she did very well postoperatively. Um, next case is uh, intersphincteric dissection. And this can be very challenging, uh, open and laparoscopically, especially in male and high BMI patients. Um, <clears throat> really, be, by being able to to have the technology to do this type of procedure. Um, it really allows uh, for a much higher rate of sphincter sparing operations. 
um, for rectal cancer, um, and it obviates the need for doing a TATME. Uh, this is the current setup. Um, obviously, patients in uh, perineal lithotomy, I use a subxiphoid type port placement in this one. Um, and then we, uh, of course, go in and do the uh, T, uh, the total mesial rectal excision. And, and in these cases, when I plan on doing a, a TATA, I will take, I'll do a high ligation of the inferior mesenteric artery inferior mesenteric vein and take down the flexure because I just uh, want to be able to get this down uh, without any tension at all. Um, obviously we need to get it out externally uh, with a couple of centimeters in order to do the hands-on anastomosis. Reoperative pelvic surgery. Uh, this, this can be very difficult to do laparoscopically. The planes are all different. Um, the patient usually uh, has altered anatomy, obviously with high morbidity uh, in open cases doing these types of procedures. Uh, and I do, I think there's much less morbidity. If you, if you can do these cases, uh, MIS, and typically it tends to be robotically. The situation um, is that this patient had a uh, high anterior resection two years earlier for a stage three adenal carcinoma at the rectal sigmoid junction. CT PET showed a left pelvic wall recurrence, uh, had no involvement of the colon, at least grossly, by endoscopy, uh, and uh, BMI of 29. And so what we find here is a recurrent cancer that's sitting right between the internal and external iliac artery and the left ureter. So I did have urology put ureteral catheters up this patient and, and uh, injected it with ICG. There's a beautiful view. Um, you can see uh, how the tumor is close to the adventitia of the ureter. Um, and one of the challenging things here is that, of course, now we're, we're getting into some bleeding uh, with the internal iliac artery. Here's external iliac. And so uh, go ahead and uh, get control of this bleeding with a, just a, a stitch. I'm not too worried about this vessel since it is the internal I iliac. Um, if it was an external iliac um, bleed, I would most likely call a vascular surgeon to come in and handle this. But again, this is, in my view, a non-critical uh, uh, vessel but it still ble bled a lot. She bled about 1,250 cc's of blood. And this tumor, her anastomosis is mid-rectum from her surgery two years ago. This recurrence is actually up higher. It's about seven centimeters above her anastomosis. So what we did here was we did the in-block resection of this recurrent tumor um, did a low anterior resection just below her anastomosis uh, with a EEA um, stapler. Uh, did not do a uh, diverting ostomy. Um, and we got a R0 uh, resection. So, again, this case took about three hours. It was on the console almost two hours. Did lose a fair amount of blood. She stayed in the hospital three days, had a, a, morphine, a milligram morphine equivalent of 15. Pathology was R0, and uh, she did very well postoperatively. Did not have any neurologic or any other, any other issues uh, whatsoever, which was great. Um, this is just uh, dealing with some other types of, of <clears throat> pelvic um, problems. Um, with doing the surgery. This is a case of a, a female that had a low anterior resection. Now I, I just, I transected the rectum about a centimeter and a half above the dentate line. Um, I personally think I got a thinned out the posterior rectum a little bit uh, inadvertently. Um, and, um, I asked my partner to come in and place the stapling device and uh, he was very kind to come in and help me but he got a little aggressive with his uh, rectal examination uh, before he placed the stapler to make sure everything was good and um, 
and so that's what happens. So we got a, a posterior wall dehiscence through the staple line, but um, again, this is pretty low. This is intersphincteric, so I'm going to have ask him to pass the spike, and then we're just going to put a little purse string in here. And actually, this uh, went very well as far as uh, we had plenty of tissue to work with here. Everything was just worked out great. Um, but we're able to sew this up pretty easily robotically. Now, of course, this is sped up to about 5X, but because I don't operate that fast. And then we do the uh, intercorporeal anastomosis and went very well. I did do a temporary ostomy on this patient and, um, and, it, and did the temporary ileostomy. So um, in conclusion, um, surgery in complex rectal disease uh, can be challenging. Um, there can be uh, high morbidity in these cases. Um, the majority of these cases require open surgery when you're using the laparoscopic technique just because of the uh, difficulty. Uh, this technology, however, uh, uh, if you can do these cases minimally, invasive, minimally invasively, it does improve patient outcomes. And again, this is one huge advantage, I think, of the uh, XI technology uh, using all the advanced technology available uh, allows for even the most complex cases being completed uh, minimally invasive. Uh, thanks again uh, for, to Intuitive and the uh, Robot Surgery Collaboration the Facebook page. Um, thank you. Craig, uh, that was a great presentation, and let me tell you something. It's very nice to be sitting here on a Saturday morning watching those instead of doing those. Those are tough, tough cases. Great job. Great illustration. I'm going to get. I'm going to start off with a technical question, and this is something that I find um, you could almost go too low robotically because it, the visualization, the access, and exposure is so phenomenal. So if you're going down, 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 and you had that last video with the with the uh, inadvertent, uh, you know, push of the stapler. Um, when you go down low, what are some of the things that you're doing not to go past your point and, and thin out that posterior rectum when you're taking, when you're dissecting? Well, if there's a uh, low tumor, um, I will go back and forth to the table, uh, get a proctoscope, look at the lesion. Um, go, I'll go down to where I, I after doing the preoperative assessment, I'll go down to where I think this is where it needs to be in that then I'll get up and do the assessment from the bedside uh, proctoscope you know digital examination um, and and try to uh, assess exactly what my margin is going to be um, and then I will place the stapler especially with the interesting teric dissections if I choose to do a, a, a double staple technique I'll place the stapling device where um, I've chosen my margin and then I will go to the bedside and feel that because I, there have been multiple times where, uh, especially in thin patients, that you'll actually be across the skin. Um, and in those cases, I may convert that to a, uh, a uh, hand-sewn anastomosis or something if a double staple won't work. So, But no, I, I do several assessments from the bedside. I'm very kind of paranoid about that distal uh, margin and... Uh, and also, you, if you go too low with the stapler, you, you have really uh, created a problem. Well, that that's, leads me to the next question that uh, we get asked quite a bit. Getting the stapler down there. So you're now at the anorectal junction. You're very down low. Are there, t are there tricks to getting the stapler down there? Is it successful? Is it unsuccessful? T tell us about getting that stapler and cutting across and transecting down in no man's land. Right. Well, you know, really, um, upper rectum is, is pretty easy to come across. Distal rectum is easier. I think mid rectum sometimes can be uh, quite difficult, but especially in these patients that uh, we go real low, I think the key is the posterior dissection to get the posterior dissection done adequately um, in the inner sphincteric space. Because uh, once you do that, then essentially you can um, straighten the rectum out and just put the stapler straight across. I tend to use my stapler port in the right lower quadrant, uh, which I think creates a really good angle for deep in the pelvis. Um, and then I'll place the stapler from about a one o'clock to seven o'clock position. 
not perfectly anterior posterior, and it's really hard to go lateral. Uh, but if I go from about one o'clock to seven o'clock, uh, I use the 60 millimeter stapler down in the pelvis to do that. And I've really not had a problem uh, doing that technique. Craig, uh, great, great videos. Again, you're a Zen master. Uh, <laughs> looking at all those complications. For me, robotics has really opened up opportunities to uh, deal with vascular bleeding, uh, dissect mesentery, do lateral sidewall dissection, multidisciplinary treatment to two. I mean, you, you just took out the uterus, did the vagina um, on, on your own, but many of our colleagues are more facile with robotics than laparoscopic surgery. So it's opened up a whole new world. In your mind, what, what were the big game changers for you uh, robotically over a laparoscopic low anterior? Well, yeah, I think it's just the, the whole technology, the stable platform, the fact that I can be my own assistant down in the pelvis and not really rely on a bedside assistant uh, with a straight stick to kind of get in my way. Um, and so, you know, with the vision and the wristed instruments, um, it's just, I don't know, it just feels more comfortable and I'm not bent over sideways trying to do these cases and getting a backache, you know, it's just much, it's just a whole different pace of the case. And, um, it's just fun, really, you know, it's just it's fun. How do you, how do you feel at the end of the day after a, after a hard robotic case versus your laparoscopic experience? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Back in the day when I was much younger, um, doing several uh, laparoscopic low anteriors or, or colon resections, I would g g go home. That's funny. My kids used to always get me, um, for Christmas and my birthday and things, they would buy me special pillows and, and heating pads for my neck and, and, you know, and these back things and buy me massages because I'd come home and I would just feel beat up. Um, you know, have to get in the bathtub to even get, get some rest, you know, do some relief. Um, but you know, I haven't had a day like that since I started doing robotics, not one time. Um, I think so that's really important because it's, uh, it really adds to the longevity of us surgeons. You know, we do such repetitive motions and I think for young people doing minimally invasive surgery, this is a big issue, but yeah. I totally agree. It's, it's added a decade to my career, I'm sure. Uh, by switching from laparoscopic to robotics. Absolutely. Yeah, Craig, so um, I'm going to draw you back to some of the technical parts that we were watching. One of the things that I was noticing is that during some of the uh, natural orifice, vaginal or rectal extractions, uh, you were putting a sponge, et cetera. Um, and then also, especially when you had the bleeder, and that was a great job, you know, not panicking, taking care of it. I totally agree, you know. Are, is air seal playing a role or were you just having regular pneumo? Because especially when you were suctioning quite a bit, it didn't seem like it was collapsing. But I wanted correct. you to talk about that. No, correct. Yes, you're right, uh, Eric. Air seal uh, in these kind of cases is a, makes a huge difference. You know, if you have a, a, a big vascular bleed, um, you can stick the suction right on that and just suck away um, and uh, be able to maintain pneumo and actually keep your visualization. You know, on that uh, internal iliac bleed, I, I was, that's as close as I've come to doing an uh, urgent opening, I think maybe ever. Uh, and my bedside assistant wasn't that good. I mean, she's a nice gal, she's very sweet, uh, but she could not get me exposure. And so I just put my instruments down on the bleeder uh, to stop the bleeding and then got on my phone and called my partner and said, hey, could you come down here for a little bit and help me? And so he came right down and then that was him doing the suction. You know, he knows obviously how to get exposure and what he needs to see to uh, control that. And so I think that's important to call for help, you know, in those situations, because that made the difference from a, a emergent conversion. I was having him come down and help me. But again, the air seal does make a difference in, in bleeding. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and if you do these cases enough, you're going to be in that situation where you get that bleeder. One, one of the tricks that that we do is uh, I'll have them remove one of the robotic instruments right away and put it in a ray tech. And right. if you don't have the best assist, you, if you get that ray tech and hold pressure, then you have a breather, just like what you're saying, you can call in somebody to help you out. Uh, but you know what you're thinking in those cases, Craig is undocking and going open boy, that's also risky. So oh, oh very risky. Right. So if you can maintain the robotic platform, 
that helps. But that, that leads me to my next question. Okay, you're doing these amazing, complex, deep pelvis. It doesn't get any harder than that. What do you have in that room? Because, you know, the viewers may be saying, who's there helping you? Do I have to have a super duper assist? Does my partner need, need to be in the room? What are you doing? Uh, what's your team like in these cases? Well, um, my team is um, one of the bedside scrub techs. Uh, we have five different scrub techs. I would rate them A, B, C, D, E, F, I guess. I don't know how many, five. Um, and if I have uh, number five in there who was in on that case and I start getting to a bleeding, I I'm, know I'm, I need to call for help. But that's that's who I have. And, uh, and you know, the thing is, is we office uh, just upstairs and usually one of my partners is around. And so if I get into trouble, I can call one of them. But for the most part, it's me to scrub tech. And that's pretty much it. Craig, uh, Craig, I think one of the most important things that I teach the fellows when they get into bleeding is um, just control it and then get your head out of the HUD and just just sit back, breathe, let your heart rate come down, make sure the OR crew is ready and prepared, and then go back at it. And I think someone like yourself, who's very experienced, obviously can do that, but we're all gonna experience these moments. And I think it's just get control and then uh, get prepared. One of my questions was, how are you technically doing your anastomoses? I mean, can you just walk us through how you're doing them? And is, is it the same every time? It's not always the same. You know, if uh, are you talking about left, left colon? Yeah, left, left colon yeah. or your low anteriors. Yeah, left colon, low anterior. I typically do a double stapled technique end to end, um, probably 90% of the time. Um, if, um, for instance, a patient has a, a high BMI um, and I'm doing a left colon, um, those are the patients I choose to place the anvil intracorporeally because I will always make a fan and steel incision. I, I stay away from the midline in the lateral incisions uh, for hernia reasons. So I'll make a fan and steel incision, put the wound protector in, drop the anvil in uh, through the wound protector tied to a proline, um, simply because, again, my bedside assistant is, is a scrub tech. You know, she can't place the anvil. Uh, that's kind of something she doesn't do. So I do it, and then I place the ports, and then I go to the console, and then I'll do a – typically I'll do a, 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 a double stapled. I'll transect the distal rectum and then uh, staple the proximal, much like Eben uh, showed in his video – then I would resect the staple line and then just put a hand-sewn purse string in and place the anvil, tie it, and then do a double staple. And then extract through the, through the uh, fan of steel. All right, great. And uh, last couple of questions here, and then we're going to uh, go on to Dr. Larson's uh, talk on, on right robotic rights. So if we can cue that up uh, next. But let me ask you this. These are complex cases. You're, uh, you're, uh, you know, I was looking at your times uh, for some of these cases, three hours, 180 minutes. I mean, I mean, what's your trick? Because we're, we're seeing, if you're looking at some of the published data on just non-complex left-sided or LARs, it's as much as 300 minutes, 320 minutes. I'm saying 180 minutes. I mean, uh, is your clock right or is it going this fast? <laughs> you know, what's happening over there? Well, the, the cases I, I show, I just, I just pull the data from the case, but you know, these were lower BMI patients. Um, and that makes a difference. I've certainly done the 300 minute cases. No, no question about it. Um, I think one of the things is the staff, uh, we've done so many of these colon resections. Um, we're into the several thousand now in the staff. Um, I, I could literally sit at the console and not say a word throughout the entire procedure. And my staff would know exactly what I needed when I needed it. And, and I tell you, that, that's how I think you do your time. You do a lot of cases, uh, have a staff who's invested in it and, and wants to do a good job. And you can just, I mean, we don't wait on any instrument stapler. I mean, it's there when we need it. And that, that adds up, you know, throughout the day. Yeah, and then, and then uh, you know, like Dr. Larson just commented, when everyone is on the same page, I, I got to tell you, when I started doing robotic and, and there was, we were not on the same page, I went in and watched our urology colleagues because they've been doing this 10 years before we started doing it. And it's like, it's going boom, 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 
boom, boom. You put it's almost like open surgery. You mean it goes much quicker. Everything's going. I got to tell you, those were phenomenal uh, presentations, and we're gonna we appreciate you being here.